If praying mantis parasites lured your best friend's kids to their deaths and then replaced them to pick off the rest of your family, what would you do? You might think a relaxing weekend at an overpriced Airbnb in the woods is more likely to end in a home invasion or a sacrifice to the old gods, but you'd be wrong. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the praying mantises in There's Something Wrong with the Children. Two couples, Margaret and Ben and Ellie and Thomas, have arrived to the weekend glamping destination somewhere in Louisiana. Even though they live down the street from their parents, Ellie and Thomas decided to spoil the vacation by bringing their kids Lucy and Spencer along. Ben wants to explore. Margaret and Ellie just want a relaxing weekend of booze and weed. And Thomas is off in the corner being salty. Apparently, the married parents are having issues, but no one's ready to talk about it. Instead, they just let their oblivious kids run wild and act like total down Where's my coach service? Oh, the bottle's right over there. It doesn't take long while on a hike through someone's unkempt backyard masquerading as a forest for the kids to wander off deep inside Carcosa, the macabre ritual site that drove Rust and Cole batch crazy. If the king in yellow is nearby preparing for a child sacrifice or two, well, I brought options. This little demon kicks a dead bird and doses everyone with a long dormant strain of avian flu before Margaret here draws their attention to the pit of despair. All children come equipped from the manufacturer with a self-destruct switch, which is immediately triggered by this boundless void. They start talking gibberish about the place that shines, pointing to the void in unison, and erupting with blood. We Weird, but kids say dumb sh all the time, and the blood that could be explained by all the decaying bird giblet dust they rocket stomped into their own lungs. The hell spawn breeders are so desensitized to these demonic omens, it doesn't even phase them until the call of the void gets a little too strong for Spencer, and Ben pulls him back from the brink like a reverse Leonidas. Turns out Uncle Ben is actually pretty great with kids when he's not rupturing their diaphragms, but we'll get back to that later. He buys them toys actually likes hanging out with them, and enjoys enabling their nascent obsession with expensive fantasy roleplay card games. When are you guys gonna have your own? Ellie and Thomas trust him and Margaret enough to let them babysit the kids all night while they go make a third mistake. Unfortunately, it isn't long before Spencer's inner cat comes out, and both kids start talking about returning to the place that shines. Now, it's a little early to assume that they're possessed, so there's not much to do here unless you're a chlor form first type of parent. No judgment. Just douse a rag with our patented sleepy time formula, place it over your child's cry hole, press and hold gently for 8 to 12 seconds, and presto! No more tantrum! The next morning, Margaret and Ben wake up to find the kids have vanished. Instead of doing the obvious intelligent thing of waking up the kids' parents and doubling their search power, they try to play a game of hungover Sherlock Holmes and track the kids down themselves. I get it. Kids are the problem you gave yourselves. But guess what? Anybody who's been around Hellspawn for longer than four seconds knows they're not firing on all cylinders on the best of days. Parents especially know this. At least if you wake them up immediately to help with the search, they can't blame you later for wasting time if something actually is wrong. Clearly, these adults can't manage the kids, but maybe they can manage their money better using today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Yes, nerds, money management. It's important. You don't want to be the average American losing $250 per year on late payments and overdraft fees, or be part of the 63% of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck. Use Rocket Money to get your financial health in order. It's an all-in-one finance app that helps you save more and spend less. Once you create an account and link your bank account, you'll be able to use the cool features that'll get you saving. If you're like me, I have tons of subscriptions that I don't use, and the companies keep charging every month. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel unwanted subscriptions. The app identifies recurring charges and cancels your unwanted subscriptions with just a tap. Get your spending under control with Rocket Money by setting budgets that automatically monitor your spending by category. You'll get notifications when you're going over your budget and you can visualize your spending. The bill negotiation feature is also cool. Upload your bills and Rocket Money scans them to find savings. Many times they can negotiate on your behalf for a better rate. Any overdraft fees? The app will walk you through steps to get you a refund. You can even connect your current car insurance info to the app and Rocket Money will find you the best rates. Go check out 
out Rocket Money. To try it out for free and unlock more features with premium, head to rocketmoney.com slash nerdexplains or click the link in the video description. Margaret notices the kid's shoes are gone, suggesting those little ass left on purpose, and Ben has a pretty solid theory as to where they went, considering they told him exactly where they wanted to go. Panicked, Ben runs for the bunker and finds the creepy crawlies he's looking for. For dramatic effect, they wait until he's begging them to step away from the bottomless pit to fling themselves into it, much in the way that a cat waits until you're watching to push a glass of water off the table. Ben is rightfully traumatized. We can even see his soul leaving his body, his pupils dilate, his body begins begins to shake, and he can't answer the phone when Margaret calls. Why aren't you answering your phone? To be fair, what would you even say? Yeah, hey babe, uh, have you ever wanted different friends? Well, have I got news for you. The only way to have prevented any of this would have been to predict their erratic goblin behavior before going to bed. Sure, you knew they were Jones and Fur, the place that shines, but it would be psychotic to board up their windows and doors on the off chance they decided to get up in the middle of the night to go bungee jumping without a rope. In the moment, Ben could have leapt forward to yank their ass back from the brink before they had the chance to say some creepy last words. But with all that forward momentum, it's just as likely to fling them in as it is to pull them out. Whatever pheromone this hole is pumping out, it started affecting the kids during their first visit. Without knowing ahead of time that there's a praying mantis infestation here, there's no real preemptive way to know and prepare for something like this. It's just too unpredictable, which I think is part of the invasive species MO. But we'll get back to that. Ben's head goes for another spin when he returns to the camp to find Lucy and Spencer rushing out of their parents' cabin alive. <gasps> Thank God. I, I see you. Due to YouTube's copyright restrictions, I can't play the audio for you. Just know we got some Omen level music playing while Ben's balls are twisting themselves into a knot. This can mean only two things. I'm talking about the kids being alive, not Ben's balls. Either what Ben saw back in the bunker was a very f up echo hallucination of something that happened earlier in the night, or there's a hole under the parents' cabin and the Mantis replacement kids crept in while Ben was off disassociating in the woods. Unfortunately, this movie never bothers to tell us which it is. But either way, this is the point at which Ben begins making literally every bad decision he can think of like he's on a speed run of Grand Theft Auto. He becomes paranoid and erratic, letting these little nosebleeders get the best of him almost immediately and with very little effort. Why is Ben staring at me? Instead of playing this cool, because it's entirely reasonable for him to be watching the kids closely after they nearly cliff jumped into a shallow well the day before, and their own parents are too busy sucking face for the first time in ages, Ben flounders, makes a stupid guilty face, and sponges up the disapproval of his peers. All previous trust the other adults had in him evaporates so quickly, it's like they know something we don't. Oh, right. They reveal Ben's taking lithium pills for some previously undisclosed mental illness. Which illness is it? If the movie will tell us, the lithium's usually used to treat mania and bipolar disorder, and in some cases is used as a supplemental mood stabilizer for people with schizophrenia. Given the constant Guantanamo Bay level pressure they're putting on Margaret and Ben to have kids, I don't think it's the latter. He shows signs of mania, his thinking is disturbed, he's agitated, and he starts doing and saying things that sound erratic to those around him. I'm not gonna blame him. Dude's had a hell of a day and it's not even nine in the morning yet. This is the danger of having kids. I mean, this is the danger of an invasive species that targets kids to replace them. Those little seed demons are assumed to be vulnerable and usually given special clearance to act weird, aloof, and unpredictable where an adult is not. And in a dangerous, uncertain situation, you're more prone to voluntarily run to the aid of a kid without presuming they are the danger. This poor chuckle f trusted his friends not to turn on him when their kids started throwing tantrums, which was the ultimate amateur move. You can't trust parents either. I'll qualify that statement. You can trust parents as far as you can throw their kids, or something. Honestly, put me in Ben's shoes. I'm in the car and down the road with Margaret asking me what my problem is before they've had a chance to wipe their noses. Dudes just witnessed their deaths and subsequent rebirths. It is time to pack it in and leave. His previous struggles with mental illness 
illness will work against them even though they shouldn't. There's no point in telling anybody about any of this because nobody's going to believe it. And Ben probably knows that. Fuck them all. Leave. If nothing happens, Ben can say he felt an episode coming on and didn't want to ruin anyone's weekend. If something does happen, at least you didn't get eaten by a fuck. Bug. This parasitic species is limited by its location and proximity to this wishing well from hell. Prey has to be tossed or lured into it for them to take control. So the farther Ben gets, the better off he'll be. Plus, Ben leaving actually puts the burden of acting normal on the kids. Without Ben, there's no one they can torment without looking strange as sh. Would that change the ultimate outcome? No, but at least Ben survives to go viral on creepypasta. It is possible the bug's pheromone isn't strong enough or doesn't work on adults. After all, if they could lure everyone to their deaths, the movie would already be over. It could also be that the parasitic essence is kid-sized on purpose, because children can more easily lower our defenses for the same behavior that would get an adult hauled away in a white van. Either way, Ben is in a super precarious situation after the doppelganger ganger show up. Either he's having a mental health episode, or he's right and no one's going to believe him. Bless his dumb heart, he even goes up to the changelings and asks point blank about the incidents in the bunker. They don't deny it, popping off matching nosebleeds like it's a party trick. Are you just torturing yourself at this point? He rushes to his cabin to isolate when Margaret comes to check on him. He tries to tell her what he saw back at the pit, but she clocks his manic behavior right away and totally dismisses him. The wife really needs her stress-free weekend, apparently. He dry swallows some lithium and gets jump scared by the changelings, who distract him long enough to steal his pills. Ben rejoins the party where they start provoking him. Spencer startles him. Lucy threatens Margaret with a fire poker, and then Spencer tries to feed him bugging infested chips. It's right about the time Spencer shows off the stolen pill bottle and Ben slaps a beer out of Thomas's hand that one of these so-called friends should be giving Ben a break. These mantises must have paid for premium talk and text plants because they have de near perfect cell reception out here. So calling Ben's doctor is step number one. The kids are clearly agitating him so tell them to leave him alone and enforce that command. Margaret should be moving Ben into the car or offering to go look at the with him in the bunker to reaffirm for him that there aren't two pint-sized bodies at the bottom. If the kids keep pestering him once the adults have separated them from Ben, then at the very least, they take some of the blame for Ben's behavior instead of leaving him out here to hang all by himself. Ben rips the stolen pill bottle away from Spencer. Thomas hulks out on Ben, but no one chastises the little sh for stealing his mood-stabilizing pills in the first place. It's a ben, you know they're trying to bait you. Make Thomas take them from him. Why would Tom want his kids around lithium pills anyway? They could be fatal. But they were candy. Do a little actual parenting. God damn. Earlier, Ellie asked Margaret if Ben was doing better, so they all know he has these moments of overstimulation, and Margaret's been through them with him. But not a single one of these dips does anything to help him, even when he begins rambling nonsense at them. Who needs enemies with friends and family like this? No rental weekend is worth sending Ben to a white padded cell. Maybe I'm going soft, but his overreaction is a cry for help, not an invitation to torment a vulnerable man. Instead, they corner Ben and all four start blasting zingers back and forth at each other. We wanted you to be responsible adults, but clearly we made a bad judgment call on you and your god mental health. Those are our children. Margaret, okay, maybe you don't know what that feels like, but it would be really nice if you try. Okay, so because I haven't experienced the miracle of childbirth, I don't know what it takes to babysit your kids. Like you two are the paragons of responsibility. We're only in this situation because the two of you pawned your creepy kids what? off on the two of us to save your marriage. You guys live like a mile away from your parents, right? That's super convenient. So then you can just pawn your creepy kids off on them too whenever you guys want to go have a foursome. I'm sorry, I know. It was more of a two and a half some. You know, maybe it's not that Margaret doesn't want to have kids. Maybe she just doesn't want to have them with you. <laughs> Woo! Damn. I even felt that slap. Um, maybe leave, guys. You have a car. You have plenty of excuses to de-escalate a touchy situation. What happened to body snatcher children, Ben? Ellie and Thomas have given you the perfect excuse to run the f*** away. Take it. There is not a chance in hell 
that I would still be here. But even if I did stay, you couldn't pay me enough to be alone with these demon spawn. Lucy and Spencer come waltzing into Ben's cabin, gearing up for a second round of gaslighting. Do not engage, Ben. Walk your ass right outside to the middle ground between the two cabins and stay in complete sight of everyone. They don't want you around their kids. Make it their problem to keep them away from you. I guess it's poetic that the couple that can't stop a about how much more mature and responsible they are than the non-parents keep misplacing their kids every time they shut their eyes. Instead, Ben lets the hell Bond crawl under his skin so fast, he's lucky they didn't convince him to walk into the pit with them this morning. Spencer slams a shovel into Ben's kidney. Ben thrusts a shovel into Spencer's diaphragm, taking Spencer down like a domino. His lips turn blue, and he stops breathing. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are definitely not all right. Ben demonstrates why CPR requires certification, and Margaret, Ellie, and Thomas come rushing in in a blind panic. Spend about 10 seconds delivering the lamest chest compressions I've ever seen, and assume all is lost. Again, you all have phones that work, and cars. Why are none of you dip? rushing him to the hospital. You're in Louisiana, not Wyoming. Five minutes later, they're calling 911 to report that Ben murdered Spencer. So, we know those phones work. What happened? Ben, you are so fu- Ellie chases Ben out of the house, and Margaret purges all that $10 wine. Ben tries to convince Margaret he's telling the truth, and asks her to return to the pit with him. You just need to see Ben! I need you to believe me. I need you to be on my side. It's a little late for that, isn't it, Ben? When there's nothing there, what then? Um, maybe that he didn't just murder a child, Margaret? Of course, there's nothing in the pit when they get there. Margaret chooses this moment with Ben standing at the literal edge of a death pit to to tell him it was all in his head and that he's a child murderer. Everything that's happening, it's just in your head. You need to listen to me. Spencer is dead. You did this. Just you. Exactly what a man struggling with his mental health needs to hear from his wife. Then, she leaves him there all alone. Well, that's one way to end a marriage, I guess. You know you don't get his life insurance if he offs himself, right, Margaret? Lucy ambushes Margaret back at the camp. Margaret tries to get her to return to her parents, but she says everything's fine. Spencer's just playing, and it's time for them to play for a while. A little creepy. Lucy starts trying to lure her into the woods, but Thomas intervenes, showing the first active interest in his kids all weekend. Meanwhile, in the cabin, Spencer resurrects and eyes his catatonic mother like a piece of tasty human prey. Margaret comes inside to find Ellie and Spencer gone. She dials Thomas' cell phone and sees it illuminate in the woods, right before loud insect sounds surround her, driving her back inside the cabin. She tries to call Ben, but he ignores her, too drawn into the place that shines. Uh-oh. Back in the cabin, Margaret hears chittering from the bedroom. She obeys horror movie logic and goes to investigate like a moron, discovering bloody walls and something making noises in the bathroom. A hand grabs her ankle. It's Ellie, bleeding out from multiple strange puncture wounds across her body. Mmm. I've seen wounds like these before. She dies in Margaret's arms right before Margaret sees Spencer leering in the shadows like that zombie girl from Dawn of the Dead. His eyes glow and he charges. She remembers he weighs all of 50 pounds and body checks him back into the bathroom floor before barricading him from both entrances. And that's when she sees it. The mantis form of whatever's taken over Lucy. Since you're not immediately running for the door, maybe feed on that adrenaline for a few seconds longer, Margaret, and grab a kitchen knife. A fire Fire poker, a can of raid from under the sink. No, we're, we're just going raw on this nightmare, I, I guess. To be fair, raid isn't actually all that effective at repelling mantids, but any chemical will irritate the hell out of them. Human shell, human weaknesses. Margaret sneaks across the floor to the car keys as the mantis children begin counting down to the hunt. She lays a false trail for them by opening the door to make it look like she went outside. And it works on Spencer, but Lucy takes the opportunity to show off her sudden teleportation powers and appears beside Margaret in the pantry. A kitchen knife would have been great right about now, but there's actually a simpler solution staring Margaret in the face. The lake. Margaret should be heading straight for the lake to the left of their cabin. Lake is grandiose. 
This is really a pond, but praying mantises tend to avoid bodies of water in general because they don't need very much water to survive. Many mantids, however, are also parasitized by hair worms, nasty spindly black strings which abandon the host's body upon contact with water, often killing the host in the process. And this is just one of many species that invade the mantis's body and eat it from the inside out. I'm not saying that the mantis that has taken over Lucy or Spencer's body as parasites. I am saying that if it does, then swimming to the little island in the center will offer some safety, depending on how far Lucy's superpowers can stretch. Margaret could then speed dial the FBI, animal control, and the nearest PD for backup until too many humans arrive for them to take on at once. Either they flee into the woods or begin picking off the other adults, giving us the chance to escape. Margaret rushes outside to discover that their 911 call about a murdered child drew exactly one park ranger to the scene. This time, it's Margaret's turn to ramble incoherently about the children. The ranger talks to Margaret like her screws are loose, instead of, you know, assuming whatever scary trauma has left this woman covered in blood is actually worth taking seriously. She doesn't even draw her weapon as she enters the house. Then, she turns her back on an active crime scene covered in viscera. Lucy's second hidden power emerges. She rips the ranger through the air via telekinesis into the cabin, then flings her broken body through a glass patio door to her death. Alright, car it is. Get in, drive out, don't stop for anything until you hit the airport and head straight for Hawaii. By the time mantids have taken over the world and gotten over their aversion to water, you'll be too drunk on Mai Tais to care. Is this a leisurely morning jog? Pick up the pace, Margaret. <laughs> Margaret, get in the car. Wait, what are you doing? You have the car keys. Do you know how many horror movie victims wish they were you right now? Did you just decide to go for the car and say, nah, let me hide under it instead? Insect kids are hunting you. News flash, dumbass. Car only helps you if you actually get in and use its exceptional speed and hard exoskeleton to your advantage. Under a car is one of the worst locations to hide. You don't know if they can smell you or if they have heightened vision or hearing. What you do know is that they have human brains capable of problem solving. Let's paint a picture. You're a mantis kid hybrid searching for your prey human. You know she's probably going to go for the car because she can't fight, has nowhere to run in the forest and surely won't stay in the house. You know she only had a few seconds head start, so she couldn't have driven away yet. You run to the garage first, and upon not initially seeing someone inside the car, you're probably going to... What? That's right, look under the car. Not only that, but when the little girl is walking up to the car from the other cabin, from her POV, she would easily be able to see someone laying down under the car like a deer in headlights. That's why it's a sh hiding spot. And if you have to fight, well, let's just say it's significantly worse than fighting in a basement. And we all know how much that sucks. Crawling under it like a bug crawling under a big rock is not only literally insect level intelligence, but the kiddos have been smashing bugs under rocks this whole camping trip. The advanced human reversal would be to smash these bugs on the bumper of your rapidly accelerating 4,000 pound fire breathing machine on wheels. As the kids draw close closer to Margaret's hiding spot, she tricks them into the woods with her father's ringtone. She finally jumps in the truck, prepared to peace out like a sole survivor before she even knows she is one, only to find Ben in front of her. Instead of pulling him into the car and speeding off into the night, she actually returns to the cabin with him on foot. Is that pheromone finally getting to you? Of course, it's not Ben, but his body snatched doppelganger. He tells Margaret the insect babies are too young to know not to kill people, but they will learn, and he and Margaret will be there to teach them and make more of them. His eyes shine, revealing the darkest thing of this whole situation. Ben leapt to his death after Margaret left him back in the cave. Wife of the year, folks. Can we just freeze frame for a moment, though, and ask something so basic it barely register as a $100 question on who wants to be a millionaire? Why would the mantises body snatch Ben and Margaret when Thomas and Ellie were already a breeding pair they could easily 
lure back to the pit. This is a lot of unnecessary risk to snatch two unwilling, barely functional non-breeders. When Margaret tries to flee, Ben tackles her, and she goes full machete, slamming it down deep into his shoulder. But instead of pulling it out and double whacking him with it, she breaks for the truck again and gets taken out by a mop. Yes, that's right, a mop. Now imbued with super strength, the kids drag Ellie, the ranger, and Margaret's bodies back to the bunker to feed into the hole. Margaret wakes up and finally chooses violence. She rushes forward and hurls them into the void, then limps back to the camp where Ben is waiting for her. Thomas Kamikaze's out of the woods and tackles him, giving her the chance to flee? I guess saving Thomas isn't a priority either. Hey, Margaret, you can't help a guy out by grabbing that machete and finishing Ben off? No, guess you'll just leave with zero eyewitnesses to the insanity you just survived. And you didn't even check the back seat before you drove away. Rookie move. I was totally prepared for Lucy to pop up in the back seat. Down the road a ways, Margaret pauses to scream before Ben and the kids make their last stand in the middle of the road for some really stupid reason. And she squashes them like the bugs they are across her windshield, which they should have seen coming. Great, now you're looking at triple hit and run charges while Ellie's back at the campsite collecting Thomas's body and feeding him into the pit. You've only left more parasites alive who know where you live. At least if you had saved Thomas, you could have brought Mulder and Scully back with you for the investigation and defeated the Mantids once and for all. You might have delayed your assimilation by a few days or weeks, but it's still coming for you. Thanks to you, Margaret, it's now coming for us all. All of this would have ended way sooner sooner if Margaret and Ben had sought a little peace and quiet away from Ben's tiny tormentors. Sure, they probably would have returned to find that Ellie and Thomas had suddenly undergone a personality change, but at least Margaret could have avoided gaslighting her vulnerable husband into kicking himself into a bottomless pit, getting an innocent park ranger killed, and from the local PD's POV, straight up murdering Ben, Lucy, and Spencer with their SUV. For that reason, I think there's something wrong with the children was beaten. Moral of the story, don't get involved with irresponsible parents, psycho kids.